hello to Conrad Anker, who's been so kind to uh, join us today uh, for our interview and Q&A session. Um, it's an honor to have you here with us today. This is, these days and circumstances are definitely challenging, but if it resulted in this panel, then it's not all bad. Um, maybe we'll start with you introducing yourself. Uh, how old are you? Where are you from? And how does your schedule look like when it's not uh, Corona time? Yeah, so shalom everyone, welcome. Um, thank you for the invitation and nice to meet everyone virtually here uh, through Zoom. So this is a, a great uh, connection. So my name is Conrad Daniel Anker. So, um, and I'm 57 years old. I'm from Bozeman, Montana. I started climbing at about age 14. Um, it's uh, what I do is how I define myself. It's um, both my passion and my my work. So my avocation and my vocation, being able to do all of them together in one, is really kind of a is a, is a fun is a fun thing for me to do. So that's always the the best part of it. So <laughs> I'm fortunate in that. Okay, and um, during these days, um, weird, strange days, um, you can still get out and get some climbing. Is it full quarantine? What's the situation in, one, in Montana? Um, here at Montana, we are shelter at home, which is essential businesses are still there. Um, so the grocery stores, the um, hospital, um, the fuel, all of that is still going. Um, we're still permitted to go outdoors and um, visit uh, nature. Um, and as long as the distances are uh, are met, but other states are not uh, doing uh, shelter at home quarantine uh, there, and so it um, and there's right now as we speak, there's all sorts of uh, people that are um, have a different view on things than I would, and they're protesting the fact that the government is asking them to stay at home, so they're meeting up in big groups and. Uh, carrying their guns, which is the American thing to do, and protesting. So, um, I'm not one of them. I'm I'm taking it easy for a little bit, using this opportunity to uh, help our garden get started and um, look inside and and find out what really is essential in life and what is meaningful. And and part of that is is get-togethers like we have right now. It's definitely a time of uh, being um, creative. Uh, that's for sure. Um, yeah. So many have seen Meru, but you've also climbed Everest numerous times, some of them without oxygen. In 1999, you located uh, George Mallory's body. You experienced a heart attack at 20,000 feet while climbing in the Himalaya. And I won't even try to mention all the ascents uh, and other achievements of yours. But let's start from the very beginning of how you started climbing. Yeah, so... Um... My family's from uh, Central California, so just outside of Yosemite, and we would always get outdoors and go um, for two weeks and with uh, mules and in the backcountry and camping and everything like that. That was our summer vacation, and so we always enjoyed that as a family, and that was sort of the introduction to it. And then uh, climbing mountains, uh, Mount Rainier, which is in Washington State, it's a volcano with glaciers on it and sort of progressing from there, going to the Alaska range and then eventually uh, beginning in 1988, going to the uh, Himalaya. Mm -hmm. And in one of your interviews, you said you mentioned football as something you didn't enjoy very much. No. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, it wasn't a great thing. Yeah, thanks uh, Guy for sharing those pictures and, and you know, there are a lot of them there from Instagram. So happy to see those all up there. Um, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, uh, football is uh, kind of institutionalized bullying. <laughs> I was never, um, I was, uh, um, I, it's just not me. I'm, I'm, uh, a, pa I'm, I'm a pacifist. I'm, I, I don't like conflict. And I, um, when you have team sports, even something like tennis, you still are playing one human against the other. You have time frame, you have a, a court, you have rules and things like that. And so, when we get together and we're going climbing, it's always, it's you and I, and it's gravity, the weather, um, our own weaknesses that are, that are the challenge, not other humans. And that's a, fundamentally a good way for humans to interact with other humans. Um, so mm -hmm. not, team sports are great and uh, enjoy watching them and they're always good. And um, yeah, 
American football is, it's sort of like eating potato chips. <laughs> you know that it's not healthy, but they taste so good. And you're like, oh, okay, I'll have a couple more. So, well, we, we don't really play football here. We have soccer, but I'm going to argue it's kind of similar. Uh, some may disagree with me, but I'm going to argue it's pretty similar. Yeah. Uh, that's taking me to my next question of, of how different, when you started, how different was climbing back then comparing to what it is nowadays in terms of of gear, uh, the grades, uh, pushing grades, um, the number of climbers. What was the scene back then? Yeah, sounds good. Um, I'm just gonna check, a couple of the uh, chats have come up. People might not be, is everyone hearing me um, okay? Yes, yes, very good. Okay, that's good. So there was, um, anyways, with that. Um, but yeah, climbing has changed quite a bit. Um, so when I started, there was, uh, there was EBs, there was one type of climbing shoes, and then the fee rays came on, and I mean, now there's so many different models and seasonal models, gym shoes and like that. So we look at the advancement of equipment. Um, and so, yeah, it was quite a bit different then. It was, um, climbing itself is uh, sort of an offshoot and a um, cross-pollinization of, uh, from the maritime. So the, the, imagine the mass of the old boats, they had to go up and down them. And so that's where belaying came from, a bollard, a lot of the terms that are in from the nautical world were applied to climbing. And one can imagine early sailors going up cliffs to find eggs for their, their, their crew to eat. And so that was when they were up there looking for uh, sea cliffs. I mean, that might've been the original start to it, but then taking those, that knowledge and applying it to the mountains is a really great, um, is, is a good way to do it. So there's, um, yeah, there's, um, it's changed quite a bit. There's more people doing it. Um, there's more access. Um, in the 80s, we went through sport climbing versus trad climbing here in the United States. Um, and so that's always, uh, you know, how we, the ethics of how we climb and how we police ourselves is probably something that, that your community is familiar with. And the, um, the Israeli Climbing Association is probably integral to kind of making sure everyone plays uh, along a similar way and, and does a good job with it. And in terms of grades, do you feel that grades have changed in, in such a sense that it's completely different? Is it not that different? How many, how much has it changed since uh, the day? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the grading is, um, yeah, when I got started, 512 was a big deal. And now it's like, oh, I've been at the gym for two weeks. I can climb 512. <laughs> it's sort of, I'm not sure which, uh, uh, rating system you use, uh, 512 is maybe 7A French. So, um, and now we look at how much climbing has, has progressed. The level of difficulty that people are um, climbing at is really, um, it's remarkable. And so, but yeah, at my age, I'm not climbing what I was 30 years ago. So I don't have to, I'm not chasing numbers. <laughs> I'm out for the enjoyment and time with my friends. And in terms of gear, how much has the gear changed? Do you feel, because you start climbing back then, but you're still, at least for the past few years, you were still pushing first ascents, um, mirror, whatnot. How yeah. much the, is the equipment um, something that makes it easier or possible to push harder? Yeah, so from traditional climbing, we'll use that as the foundation, the advent of the uh, spring-loaded camming devices. So friends and then camelots and um, all the different brands of uh, camming devices really made a big um, difference rather than passive protection now all of a sudden there was um, the spring-loaded uh, cam devices which were really good uh, the sticky rubber and, and being able to get shoes that fit better and more precision and really thinking through that um, the grigri um, the auto lock relay device was integral it allowed people to uh, hang on the rope and work out a move and a level of security that was uh, that made it safer. Uh, in the big mountains, there's um, a lot of these same advancements, the auto lock relay device, um, cams, um, sticky rubber, not so much, but just the overall improvement in how people are climbing better is allowed for more difficult routes in the mountains that people are able to go do. And that's kind of a, um, uh, a key part. And that's um, that, that opportunity is, um, it, for what we see in the rock climbing abilities increasing, then that carries over into alpine climbing. So it's really neat to see that, um, how it goes from one area to the next. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about the beginning for 
from the other side of it, uh, being a senior climber, um, talk a lot about mentorship. And I would like to ask you about this relationship, both being uh, a beginning climber, and you talked about having a mentor, and both being a mentor yourself. Uh, how important was that for you as a beginner, beginner, and that role as someone who taught others? Yeah, great question. Um, in climbing, someone literally has to show you the ropes. Um, so there's, <laughs> that's kind of a saying here in English. Oh, I showed someone the ropes and, and sort of um, knowing the ropes is again, another sailing term, but um, in climbing, it really does make a difference on that if you're able to, um, to learn from that. Um, whereas um, running, you're able to get out there and, and, and sort of get after it. And, and you know what running is, it's very natural with it. And, um, um, but with climbing, you want to have um, mentors. And so this photograph here, that's Alex Lowe. So he was more my equal. Um, we were both the same age and um, climbed together. But um, the first mentor I have is specifically as, as being. Yeah. Yeah. Muggs is a uh, mentor. And so there's um, uh, a couple pictures up uh, off of Instagram there a few, a few mm -hmm. uh, days ago that a week or so ago that I had put up. But um, yeah, someone that. Um, will help you out and do that. So I now take this opportunity to share my experience with other people and give them an opportunity to, to learn about climbing and it, it kind of comes back around to you, which makes it uh, really nice. That, um, and as part of what your climbing association does is that you um, help bring people in and, and, and share with them. And it, um, that's the beautiful thing about it is that wherever one goes, you have a international a uh, group of friends through climbing that's really solid and it's you can be stuck and you'd be like hey yeah i mean yeah there are exceptions to it there are people that are not um not polite in, within the climbing world but most climbers are are pretty open-hearted and uh, because it's such a serious thing that the consequences of making a mistake and everyone's been through death with climbing that you have a, mm -hmm. a pretty open and, and accepting point of world view so, so I, that actually leads me there to my next question. Um, climbing, or should I say alpine climbing, is, is dangerous. Um, so do you remember the first time you felt fear uh, or and how you dealt with it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, well, the first time I felt fear was probably as a little boy. Some, I don't know, getting in over my head and, and um, well, all these different things. I remember I fell out of a pickup truck once or another time I sort of got scared by an animal or something like that. But uh, fear is your self-preservation instinct speaking to you. And so understanding and listening to your fear is really good because it's what, it's what keeps you alive. And so um, not having any fear might be um, something that people, they kind of think they might have it and then they do something silly to get a, a YouTube video of doing crazy things. But um, if there's, um, um, if there's anything that fear is, it is that it is your reminder that we have a finite amount of time here and you have to make good, wise decisions. So uh, explain it because you, you do pretty scary and I would argue dangerous things. So yeah, they are dangerous. How does <laughs> these two things work together? Yeah, so ice climbing is dangerous. Alpine climbing is dangerous. Himalayan high altitude climbing is very dangerous. All that is, um, has a serious amount of risk involved with it but we build upon our experiences so each experience is a layer a foundation a building block for your next journey something like that so when you have successive um, expeditions you, you get stronger each time and that's sort of how you um, how you build upon it mm -hmm. and in one of your interviews you stated that um, the young generation that the young people um, who say they have no fear or do the crazy stuff just haven't developed their frontal lobe yet. Um, <laughs> so yeah. uh, do you remember yourself in that place? Do you remember yourself doing things that you now uh, look back and say that was stupid, that wasn't smart to do? Yeah, there's roots that I did in, um, in my 20s that um, objective hazard is, is, is walking underneath hanging ice, things like that, avalanche hazard, things like that. Subjective hazard is making a mistake on my own. So objective is, um, you can control it by not being in that location at that given time, but it is something that you have to, um, that you have to think about. And um, so the, um, that level of objectivity makes it um, um, having to get out there um, 
and make the right decision about things are, is, is pretty keen. And so, um, yeah, that's, I think they've done tests on it and it's scientifically validated that, um, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed. So, um, there's a silly film in the United States called Jackass where people do crazy stuff. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> so very calculating okay. what we do. Can, can you remember a specific, a specific story of being in a situation where uh, as a young person, you felt uncomfortable, but you pushed it anyway? Um, yeah, I was, uh, I free soloed a fire escape. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, for some reason I thought it was cool, but um, but it's just the metal that's attached. The first descent and a new route. I mean, that is that's my motivation. I mean, maybe it's my stab at immortality. Yeah, yeah, there's a little video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you said that um, having first descent uh, is part of your motivation. Yeah, that has to come with a certain degree of risk because you're go you're climbing to the unknown. Anyway. Yeah. So how, how do you approach these kind of climbs? Um, so first ascent climbing is um, you get this opportunity to uh, go where people have not climbed before. So that's kind of a neat little um, section within that. So um, kind of a neat, well, it's good to see these images here. But um, I guess in a sense that if you open up a climb, then you're the first person to go there and, and you leave a track and um, yeah, it's ego driven. I mean, we have to admit that, um, that you want to have something that's out there and that other people can do. Um, but yeah, there is, um, most of the risk I think is, is manageable. I know where I'm at and, and the terrain that I'm on. Um, but that unknowing that risk makes it what it is and makes it special. And if it, if we, some people have an appetite for risk and they want to seek it out because it changes their, their, their outlook in the world and so their their mental view and uh, it, it comes into their value set and is a meaningful thing for them so that's um and for those people it's a, it's a great thing i think all of us that are listening in today we we get it i mean no one's here having to ask us why we climb everyone's a climber on this uh so what is all your motivation it's my motivation your life i guess I wake up in the morning and i just hold on and where's life going to take me today so it's <laughs> It's a great ride and a great experience. And so everything from going out with uh, uh, friends and hiking or playing with the dogs or gardening and um, to find joy in everything that we do. And um, where we are right now with the, uh, the COVID pandemic is a great example and a great opportunity for us to, re to be reminded that um, if you can't change the situation and you're upset about it, you can always change your outlook to it. So, yeah, I might, I'm not going climbing, but climbing isn't the most important thing. And I put it in the context of people suffering, it is a very frivolous pursuit. But then again, we work so we can have time for recreation. And that is what um, finding things that, pardon me, we can do that give us uh, meaning in life. Oh, pardon me. That's really kind of the, the key part to it. And I have to ask, how did your parents react to this choice of yours? Uh, well, they were fine. <laughs> they introduced me to that. Yeah, they're fine. So well, they, I, I went climbing with my parents. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, throughout your life, you've had, um, you had your share of losses, um, namely uh, Alex Lowe and Muggs and David Lama and, and others. And you shared, uh, particularly regarding Alex Lowe, um, how immensely it affected you. And if, you, if you're okay with sharing with us um, what happened there and, and the process uh, you've gone through since. Yeah. So, um, well, coming up on 21 years ago in October, we were on a climb in Tibet on Shishapan Line. An avalanche came down and... Uh, swept the life of uh, David uh, Bridges and Alex and I was with them and I just went a slightly different area and then um, I was able to uh, to make it through and so it's a great picture of Alex with uh, our son Max there so yeah it was a tremendous loss and um, that moment uh, will always sort of be with me and um, but yeah thinking about what um, he had left behind three young three young children and a widow so um that was the, sort of the foundation of our love for jenny and i and 
being in the mountains together. So kind of a neat, a neat way to uh, look at that. And um, yeah, it's been a great journey. And, and you stated that you thought after that you were going to just be a hermit uh, when you ran and then <laughs> yeah, I always <laughs> <there as well. laughs> yeah, I'm always like, yeah, it's, um, I'm kind of, uh, introverted by nature and living in an extroverted life. And so climbing is sort of an introverted type. Um, we're all <laughs> seem to be a group of introverts and these were very, we do like to do what we do, but we're not, um, it's, um, there, I mean, I think it's self-selecting with the sports that we do, but yeah, there's, um, always that, that dream of, uh, being a hermit and living in the mountains and, but then again, it's too much fun being around friends and people. <laughs> it's, and travel is too good. I have, I have to get to Israel still. So that's part of my goal. That's going to happen. We're just waiting for the flight to get back to. Uh, yeah. We're on it. Yeah. Um, and I do have to ask, though, um, was it, um, did you experience, experience difficulty getting back to climbing, uh, and especially alpine climbing after these uh, experiences? Um, not not in a deep way i mean it's so much of what i do and that being in the mountains is um rejuvenates me and brings me happiness it's not something i need to go do so uh, it's probably different for soldiers or police um that um they're not going into those situations um willingly and the and the, and the suffering that they're encountering isn't really uh something that they're um kind of going through um, by their own choosing. So that does make a bit of a difference to it. And if you think about it in terms of family, um, having family, having kids, um, is that something that changed the way you perceive climbing or the amount of risk you're willing to take? Yeah, probably once um, Jenny and I were married and I adopted the boys, um, I took on less risk. But for someone that's outside looking in, they think that's absolutely crazy. But you're like, well, you climbed Everest without oxygen and you did the Meru and these other type of climbs. And yeah, it's, um, you're always out there kind of um, challenging yourselves in, in, in that. And so that level of risk is, it comes down to the individual and what they're, um, how they're able to do that. So it's kind of a key component to it. And, um, and just by the same measure, I would never um, profess to be a, a doctor. Um, and yet when doctors, when they are at the peak of their ability, can really do great things, say a neurosurgeon or something along those lines. And um, so that humanity is large enough and, and, and it's broad enough that people can choose what they want in life and excel and pursue those things and do well. And fortunate that I found climbing and it, I've been able to kind of follow along with that. Um, I feel like everyone would agree on that statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Find something yeah. good in life. Um, you know what? Let's take Meru as a study case just because um, I guess everyone here uh, or almost everyone has watched uh, the movie. So what does it take to climb such a mountain, such a peak in terms of training, in terms of costs, of the amount of gear? What does it take? Um, well, Meru, it, it was... Um, it'd been a life goal of mine. And so I was there on three expeditions. First one was 2003 and then um, again in um, 2008 and then 2011, eventually having success on it. So, um, but for that, it was, I mean, your airfare to get over there, um, maybe a thousand five hundred dollars or something, you know, getting to the Himalayas is it's a big part of your airfare is that. And then, there's a peak fee. I think the peak fee for Meru was two thousand dollars, payable to the Indian Mountaineering Federation. So they um, give you the permission to go climbing, and then you have a support staff and things like along those lines. So um, probably oh about um, oh twenty. Um, all said for three people, about twenty thousand dollars, about seven thousand dollars a person, mm -hmm. and the equipment that you have, you kind of. You collect it and you build it up over time and it's always it's always there so <laughs> and in terms of training do you, you I, I can only assume you have specific training for uh doing such a thing how long does it take what does it include yeah most of my training is uh, maintaining a physical fitness and then 
if I'm fortunate enough, um, I go climbing with friends five days a week. So um, whether it's at the climbing gym or outdoors or always trying to find some way to get out there um, for a little bit on that. So um, it's kind of a, a key part to it. So. Okay. And um, can you share with us just a bit about how is it, does it feel to be up there? in terms of decisions, in terms of cold, in terms of food? Yeah, so um, most of the, the food sort of when you're on a big mountain like that, it's um, you're there for, um, for the experience. You're not out there to have a picnic or you're not um, mm -hmm. eating the fine cuisine in Israel. So, I mean, you guys have great mm -hmm. food. So when it's time to eat good food in a restaurant, that's what you live for. When you're up there, it's just fuel um, to, keep, to keep you going. So. Um, that, that's sort of, um, it's fuel that, um, that, that keeps you through it. So, but then when you're up there, the, the temperature is, is obviously very cold and you have to make sure that you have um, um, proper insulation and everything. But once you're there for a certain period of time, then you get used to the cold and it, and it works out fairly well. And in terms of decisions from relatively, maybe they're not even small decisions in terms of who's going to climb the next pitch to um, should we bail or not, which is a big decision. Yeah, most of, um, with your, if you're with good partners and you're in a small team, those decisions happen naturally. They're, they happen organically. It's nothing that you sit down. Having led a large expedition with 12 members and having either a scientific or a media objective, say on Everest, then leadership is vastly different. You have to then take into consideration the overall goals of the expedition, the health of all the members, um, how it's gonna work out, how it's gonna um, key in with the Sherpa team, all of that really has to um, kind of key together on those, on those moments with it. Um, but like on a small trip, let's say, for instance, like Meru, everything really comes together and it, and it works out well. And how devastating, or uh, it's a big word, but um, I'm asking, was it devastating, devastating for you the second time you didn't make it? Oh, no, it was no big deal. <laughs> just, just like that? Yeah. Hey, we're not, we tried, we gave it our best shot and then we didn't make it up. And then, how, far you, how far were you from the summit? Oh, probably 200 meters. Um, but we realized that if we went up, that it would just be too risky. Um, and that we're over that edge. And so, um, yeah, we probably could have made it and whatnot, but um, it would have been just that level of, of um, but yeah, it was good that we had, it, it gave us a chance to come back and finish it up. And we wouldn't have had that film if, it, if we hadn't come back to it. Was it clear for you that you're going for a third go, or is it something that happened sometime after? No, with um, when I try a mountain, it's not always the first time that you have success on it. Many of these climbs, you go back two or three times before you get success. And mm -hmm. but for me, I'll try a mountain three times, and if I don't make it by the third time, then it's um, yeah, third third time lucky or three strikes and you're out. So it's baseball or. If you swing at the ball three times and you don't get it, you're out and you have to go. <laughs> you don't get on base. So, um, and I have to ask, and I guess I'm not the only one who's be curious. Um, your decision, uh, your choice of having Renan with you, um, that's crazy. And obviously, you made it, but it, it's a dangerous choice. And I was, I'm wondering about. Um, what Jenny had to say about it, how you felt about it, what happened in the mountain there, which wasn't really clear. Was he having a stroke yeah. or not? Yeah, so um, a lot of respect for Jimmy. And Jimmy stood by Renan and said, hey, Renan thinks he can do it. And so there was that, um, a lot of, well, you know, coming back that quickly from a very serious accident. And um, yeah, Jenny wasn't, she would have preferred I'd gone out um, with uh, someone that, uh, um, a third partner. So you. In, in in climbing these larger climbs, so you, if you have three people, you're a little bit safer. And in terms of one person is injured, you have two people to rescue that person. So that's kind of the key part to it is getting that um, is, is being is being part of it. But um, yeah, everything worked out well in the long run. So that's always uh, the key part to it. Yeah, you know, this is a nice little photograph of the three of us on the summit there. So 
Um, you have the amount of crazy stories you have is just like impossible. But in 2016, you've had a heart attack during a climb with David Lama uh, at 20,000 feet. Um, can you tell us what happened there? Uh, because yeah. I think not many here at least know that story as much as about uh, Miru. Yeah, so um, there's, uh, it was the 16th of November, 2016. And so we were trying Lunagri, which uh, David eventually um, came through and was able to climb in, um, uh, in uh, 2018. There's David and I in a 10 after our 2015 attempt, um, having come back to it. But um, yeah, it was um, my left anterior descending artery in my heart. Um, there was a, uh, a blockage that occurred there. And so I realized uh, painfully that it was a heart attack. And then we self-rescued and I was able to get down to um, base camp and then hitchhiked a ride on a helicopter and fortunately Dr. Yadav Bhatta um, was uh, in Kathmandu and was able to perform an angioplasty so um, yeah it was a, a pretty humbling moment and uh, sort of life awakening. Um, do, do you have you changed uh, your perception of danger of taking risks uh, ever since or after your recovery was pretty much the same. Yeah, there, I, I mean, I still, 2017, Jimmy Chin and I climbed Obatana, which is a big wall in Antarctica. It wasn't altitude, but it was very cold. Um, so there was, yeah, a lot of, um, a lot of these, uh, it, but yeah, I, I think it's a gradual, it wasn't like night and day. I just turned off the switch and, and, and so I still enjoy it. And yeah, I won't be climbing, I'm not climbing what I am, today as I did in my 30s and um, in another 20 years I'll be happy to climb up and down the stairs or just to go for a walk so it's all um, it's not the the difficulty but it's the outlook that you have as you're doing it that's the important thing and that um, if, it, if that remains constant then you'll find happiness even as the ability changes over time well, I think it's pretty safe to say that in 20 years, you'll probably do harder things than most of us. Uh, but I will ask you, um, what are your current uh, goals or um, objects that you would like to uh, achieve? Yeah, with some um, continue rock climbing through the summer. Um, I'd like to um, uh, continue our work with the Kumbu Climbing Center, which is vocational training for high altitude Nepali workers um, to get over there in the and climb with them and to increase our ability as um, uh, to train people and whatnot and to help those people, my friends from Nepal out. Um, it'd be great to get to Antarctica. Um, I would like to finish the seven summits. So <laughs> I know it's a silly thing, but um, I, I'm almost there. So <laughs> I might as well finish it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Okay, and um, can you tell us a bit about your training? Do you have like specific trainings you do or um, routine or is it just like going out climbing five days a week? Um, probably, I, I don't have like a super strict routine and um, my generation is the last generation that you could get by by having natural climbing ability and just climbing a bunch. Now it's, a very serious amount of training that goes into it. And I, I do train, I maintain my physical fitness with it and running and, and, and uh, core exercise and finger strength. And um, so probably um, the, the, the basis of it was sort of centered around our climbing gym here. So I would um, check in there and we had a Wednesday morning, 6 a.m. we'd meet up and we'd climb. And uh, within that, in my, um, I, I'd have a journal. So I would take notes of how I'm climbing and then um, always trying a, a slightly harder route that's there and, and, and progressing on that so you, you can kind of see what's going on there. So, um, but yeah, there's, um, I think just, um, if you're into training, that's wonderful and a, a tremendous amount of respect. Um, but I just, I can't go into a room, a bunch of people and, and, and jump around and do things and, 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 and have commands at me. And at this point, it's more important that I walk outdoors on a trail and I smell the leaves and the flowers and listen to the birds and enjoy nature. And that the mental relaxation I get from that is of more importance than physical fitness. So 
I want to stay healthy. I want to stay strong, but I'm not. Um, yeah. So, but the nice thing about training is, is you climb harder and better. So <laughs> thing um, that I'm like, I always got, there's a little bit of me that's always in there training. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Uh, definitely. Uh, it's, it's interesting because in Israel, uh, the sport uh, has evolved immensely in the past 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and from a group of, I don't know, hundreds, 150 people, it's now thousands. Uh, many of it is uh, thanks to the Ninja Warrior, which started in Israel and made a lot of people know about climbing. Yeah. It's also having climbing in the Olympics and we see how the sport changes. So um, one of the things I love the most, I, 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 I'm lucky enough to, to have started when I was a child. Um, there was a gym when I, where I grew up um, and the, the sport definitely changed throughout the years. And I'm curious about how you see it nowadays, uh, the good and the bad, and how do you think it's going to, what's, what's next? Uh, what's yeah. next for us? Yeah, great question. Um, think of, of climbing kind of like a tree. And so all these different branches. And so the, the roots of it is you're playing with gravity and you're going up a mountain. So whether you're high altitude climbing, um, mid elevation climbing, uh, wall climbing, tread climbing, ice climbing, bouldering, deep water soloing, sport climbing, speed climbing, gym climbing, um, climbing parkour style. I mean, there's just so many different ways. And because there's so many ways that we can interpret and play with gravity, which is sort of the, this is what gravity is. It, it's always there. It's the, it's, it, it never leaves us. And we're just finding different ways to play with it. And that's what makes climbing beautiful is that, you never really get bored of one type. And so you can enjoy the mountains and layer onto that. It's this great way to interact with other humans. It's very friendly and, and, um, and supportive of them. And then you get to be outdoors in nature, which has beneficial effects for our living in this oversubscribed society where it's so busy and there's all these demands um, placed on us from work and in the world around us that when you go out and you relax outdoors, it really has a, a benefit. And if we're learning anything from the COVID crisis is that the, the therapeutic benefit of being outdoors. We definitely appreciate it much more. Uh, and that's very, very clear. Um, are there summits or objectives that you feel that you would like to achieve, but you, you're not going to make it in that's for the next generation. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, there's, um, I tried Annapurna three. I'm not going to go back. Um, <laughs> so, um, there's, uh, yeah, there's no question. There's mountains that I'd given it my best shot and then, um, yeah, I'm not going to come back, but it's let it go. And the, the next generation, they'll, they'll continue to, to challenge themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, at, at this point, I'm going to say thank you uh, one more time and tell you that you are most invited to Israel whenever uh, COVID-19 uh, is going to pass, uh, hopefully as soon as possible. Uh, you're most welcome and you're going to be uh, uh, invited by the Israeli Climate Association. Yeah. Um, when I thought about this interview, I tried to think of themes I told you in our uh, preparation talk, and it, it became very clear that the, the, this issue of life and death and risk and uh, reward is a main theme in your life. And, and talking to you makes it clear, uh, makes it very, very clear how passionate you are for life and how positive you are in your perspective. And it's even kind of surprising um, how lightly you take, take things. Um, so thank you for um, quite a few lessons. And at this point, I'm gonna uh, invite everyone to open their uh, videos, your your cameras. I'm gonna speak in Hebrew for a second. Oh yeah. Um, don't open your mics. Don't let me call phone in. And I'm now going to invite them to come in and one by one, those who have asked questions, to ask questions. The first one to ask questions is Shachat Levin. Well, hello, Conrad. It's been a pleasure listening to this interview. Uh, I've wanted to ask you, you've been on so many expeditions and trips, and a few of them we, we got a glimpse through Real Rock or YouTube. Uh, was there a specific one 
that you enjoyed the most or meant the most for you? And could you tell us a bit about that experience? Yeah, uh, thanks, Shahaf. I hope I, I pronounced your um, your name correctly. So uh, the Meru climb was sort of my life goal of everything that I'd worked together. And so that um, being able to do everything in um, this sort of came to a culmination with that. It was a really meaningful one. Another uh, expedition that was uh, really wonderful was uh, in 2002, um, Jimmy Chin, Rick Ridgway, Galen Rowell, and myself walked across Western Tibet to study the Tibetan antelope. And although there really wasn't climbing, we were still on expedition and being able to help out with um, the wildlife that was there. So that was, um, that was really meaningful to, to give something back to the wildlife community. And then being that, um, um, being that far removed from society was kind of a, a really neat part of it. Uh, the next question is by Alan Bookstein. Alan, please turn up your mic. Turn on. Oh. Hey, Conan. Pleasure talking to you. Alan, how are you? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so my question was uh, on uh, like a climb with a high commitment. Sometimes things go wrong and not as you plan, like what you had in Meru in uh, 2008. So I always find it really hard to find a point uh, that you need to bail to go back like how risky is it if should i keep pushing and get to the summit or whatever like do you have any guidelines that you use uh, if you need to bail or keep on pushing yeah um kind of think about where you're at and what your um what your reserves are how much uh, strength do you have how much food do you have um, how challenging is the climb that you're there and are you getting uh, sort of messages that are telling you things could be less than ideal so for example in 2008 when we turned back from Meru close to the summit um, I dropped an ice axe um, we'd lost a, a glove or two in the process um, we didn't have any food and we realized we would have to sit out overnight or repel in the middle of the night and um, given that that made the chance of um, a mistake greater it was probably our um, it was better for us to uh, to turn back thank you very much yeah you know what Asaf actually asked a similar question um, now I'm going to ask a question on behalf of Matan Benachel so um, and I quote it seems that every generation of climbers is breaking new records that were considered impossible in the past I would like to ask Conrad and ask you if you think there are any current limits that will be pushed in the future for the next generation of athletes and climbers and what will they be yeah so um, there's uh uh, having a um, doing the, the the climbs in the greater ranges with um, with less equipment um, and in greater style, so um, that does in, sort of predicate more risk in the process of it. So that um, does make it more of a challenge when you have to do it like that. And that's um, is pretty much um, the direction that climbing is going. Is that there's um, and that's what the appeal to or um, kind of um, celebrates is that ability to, to do those really challenging climbs with a minimal amount of equipment. Mm -hmm. There's another question here uh, by Nitsan Ben Tovim. Is there a story about those ice axes behind you? Oh yeah, <laughs> let me get them. Yay. Great question. Thank you. So the one, this one here is a, uh, a bamboo axe, uh, a Chenard one, and uh, this had belonged to Alex Lowe. So um, usually it's upstairs by the fireplace, but we put it down here to um, make a little studio and get people excited about it. And so you contrast that to what, um, this is a modern day ice tool um, for water ice climbing. It has a, a grip on the bottom and a handle and a, fairly different type of tool uh, than what you used in the back and the other one there is um, 
sort of a, a modern day uh, wooden replica ice axe from uh, Gravel. And it's mostly there just to, to, look, to look like it's having fun. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, thank you. Yes, Okta, you're next. Hi, Conrad. Nice. Okta, we can't really hear you. If you can speak louder, please. Okay, just a second. I'll try to. Hi, Conrad. Hey, how's it going? Good. It's nice having you. Yeah, thank I'm you. Thanks. I'm a professional climber from Israel, and I'm getting older each year. <laughs> 42 this year, and I wanted to ask you if you need to feel still the feel of progression, and what do you feel about maintaining professional climbing in older age? Yeah, so um, great question. The um, I'm I'm probably more of a storyteller than I am a uh, um, than a professional climber. <laughs> um, these are people climbing much harder than I am. And you look at what uh, Alex Honnold's been able to do without a rope. And that's um, kind of a, a, a neat way to look at that. But um, yeah, the, um, it, uh, I guess it comes back to what we were talking about earlier in the interview with Omer is it's about enjoying the outdoors and kind of being there uh, with your friends. It's the most meaningful for me. You don't need to feel progression or doing something harder. Oh, at fifty-seven, progression is. is it's, I'm not gonna. <laughs> if, I can ma if I can maintain, then I'm happy. But I'm not expecting to. Yeah, that's. Um, yeah, I go back and I'm like, oh, this climb was easy ten years ago. Now it's more of a challenge. So um, yeah, there's. If I set myself up that I have to have. A progression in it then i'll then it, it might not i'm just happy for it to be where i am and with my ability being uh, if i can hold it and not lose it then i'm doing okay okay thanks yeah okay this actually leads to the next question then by amit bendel uh, and i quote a bit of, a bit of funny question but i actually wonder about that a lot uh, what grade can you climb? Sport climbing red point, and what grade was your next grade when you were at your best form? What grade would you uh, say most world class alpinists can climb on rock? So that's actually a lot of questions. And he uh, concludes by thank you. You are a legend. Oh. Well, if I um, nowadays if I can climb um, all grades of 511 and water ice five um, then i'm happy i um and i can do a few 512s um but i was never able to do a 513 so um but on sighting 512 in back in the day um now i have to rehearse it and but I've, that's like oatmeal for a lot of climbers <laughs> so easy stuff but yeah just if i'm happy if i can climb 511 and water ice five then then uh, life is good Okay, uh, Kaylee Meyer, I hope I, I pronounced the name correctly, asks, uh, do you find that there is a big difference, is there a big difference uh, between climbs that are filmed and climbs that are not filmed? Great question. Um, yeah, so there's, um, you know, some of the, the differences. Um, when I'm out there working with a camera, um, so our goal is to bring back a, a story uh, from being on the climb, and that's kind of a, an important part of it. So. Um, but it doesn't i'm not going to take greater risks because the camera is there um, it's mostly working with the camera to make sure that um, we can tell the story well so that might you'll need three different camera angles um, maybe a fourth camera angle so you do that one pitch four times and it's close to the same light each time so it gives you a chance to uh to sort of progress with that mm -hmm. Um, Shahab Levin is, at, is asking, did you start off with score climbing or trad climbing and which is your go-to? Yeah, so I started out with trad climbing. Um, <laughs> there wasn't sport climbing uh, when I got started with it, it was just climbing. And, um, but I like it all. Um, yeah, super scary trad climbing. It's not quite my cup of tea anymore. I don't want to get that run out and expose myself to that level of risk. And, um, but yeah, if I had, um, they said you can only have one type of climbing left. It would be sport climbing. I would I would choose that. Just 
Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. By Stai Bindel. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Conrad. Hi, Sean. Uh, How are you? I'll, I'm great. I'll start off with your legend. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a different question, not specifically about climbing. Um, I know a lot about your, like, uh, all kinds of activities in Nepal. You mentioned it a little bit earlier about the KCC, the Colombo Climbing Center. And I would like to know a little bit more about it. If, like, uh, travelers can participate and volunteer around there. How does it work? Like, what's the NGOs? Of the yeah. Park? So it's uh, vocational training. So ways in which the people that work in the mountains, primarily Nepalese, can be uh, safer uh, climbers. So it's... Um, we're now 17, 17 years of, of running it and it's entirely um, in their own, um, they, they work everything on their own. So they, they fund it, they manage it, they, it's, it's all on their own, which is really good to, to see that progression with it and to make it safer for the people that work in the mountains. It's really a key part to it. So um, it'd be great to integrate more with the uh, IFMGA guide program. That would be another um, good way of um, kind of bringing that together. The, um, the, the classes are designed for the people of Nepal that are working there, but if you go visit uh, the program, which is in the village of Fortse, it's a, it's a day uh, up the valley from Nanche Bazaar in the Mount Everest region, you can, um, you can go there and there's good rock climbing, um, a whole bunch of different sport climbs in around that area. There's a bouldering wall at the physical building that's there. Yeah, and then I ice saw that. In the so, yeah, it's, um, and it's always great. Whenever I travel in Nepal, I, I always meet a lot of Israeli uh, travelers. And it's always great to see them, and in, in, especially in the Kumbu. So, um, yeah, check in. And once uh, travel restrictions lift, we'll have more of a chance to go over there and visit people. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, next question is by Yael Abadi, who is asking, uh, do you see different approaches to climbing from younger climbers? Uh, do you see different mentality or different approach to climbing? Um, there might be a little bit, but I, I don't see that much of a uh, sort of a fundamental difference. Um, they're out there to, to go enjoy themselves. They might be training in a different way. Um, yeah, they're... I mean, nowadays people are introduced to climbing through the climbing gym. And when I got started, it was mountaineering. And so you had to have that background to, uh, to, to be in mountaineering um, that then brought you into climbing. So, um, but I think at the end of the day, they're, um, yeah, you, you just have a good time with it. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tal Zangville is asking, are there times you feel unmotivated and how do you deal with it? Oh yeah, everyone, you know, motivation goes like this. It's not always uh, you're out there motivated to go climbing. Um, but you just let it, let it be. Find something else that interests you, whether it's playing music or writing or um, being with your family, cooking, something like that. Um, yeah, there's, um, but it's always, the mountains are calling. I'm always like, oh, I got to go outdoors. I'm going to go do something. So that's always a sort of a, a part um, that I just want to go out and go do. <laughs> okay. uh, next question by Hanina Kali. Please turn on your mic. Hanina, are you here? Yeah, but uh, I think that Khan hi. Um, hi. I think Khan answered also through the your questions and also office questions. I was thinking, um, especially after what happened to you in 2016, um, getting back to yourself and, and, and whether you felt it, uh, that maybe you're endangering yourself or maybe that, that uh, you're already in a situation that you shouldn't be doing these things anymore or you, you just continued on. Yeah, I still get out and I still go climbing. It's um, my passion in life. It's what defines me and I find greatest happiness with it. And so I won't be doing the same level that I was. Um, um, and sort of like a, a, a transition in acceptance and understanding of how it uh, changes, but not, not necessarily being like, oh, I'm going to quit because I can't do it anymore. Um, that's, uh, you just want to, you want to be um, you're still out there and still go do it. And um, it's, it's what I do. And if it no longer is, um, appeals to me from a, 
a standpoint of um, what I want to do with my life, then I would let it go. But uh, that I, I, I wake up, but I still want to go climbing. It hasn't like said, oh, don't quit climbing now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Andre Segev is asking, um, and I quote, I know it's a throwback to the past, but I'm interested about uh, George Mallory search party in 1999. Who initiated the search party and also wondered uh, did Mallory's climbing story inspire you? Uh, for me as a teenager, it was the beginning of my love for mountaineering. So that's a lot of questions, but about that story. Yeah, great question. So um, 1999 was part of the Mallory and Irvine research expedition. My friend Dave Hahn invited me along with it and uh, we were part of the team. So it was quite unexpected uh, that on the 1st of May, I uh, found the body of George Mallory. It was a very humbling moment and um, uh, pretty, pretty intense in that sense. Um, because if you're up there doing these type, of, um, these type of sports, you have to make peace with your own mortality and death. So that was um, kind of an important part of it. But one that um, in looking back with the greatest amount of respect for them and that we, um, each generation, is able to do what they do with the help of the previous generations. And that continual understanding is really key to um, how we, how we, how we approach climbing. Um, Shahab Levin asks, is asking, uh, do climbing legends such as yourself um, have fear of falling? And fear of falling. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, whether rock climbing falls, so, you know, if you're, if you're sport climbing and you're, you're expected to fall to progress, I mean, that's part of the, uh, we're all familiar with that, but a fall in the mountains or a fall um, on ice climbing is not something that you really want to, uh, um, to, to think about. And so, um, and we probably have nightmares. Climbing, <laughs> climbing, is that still an issue sometimes? Like knowing it's going to be a weeper, um gosh i haven't had like a whipper on in a bad situation in, in years i mean i fall rock climbing uh sport climbing onto a pole and there it's just more like accepting the fall rather than just sort of like falling or you know sitting on the rope or grabbing it too early i mean just punch it until you can't knowing that it's overhanging that it'll be an easy um terrain but if you fall on lower angle stuff it can be uh, you can really injure your ankle and, Kind of like falling down a cheese grater, which isn't that good. <laughs> uh, Norm Hills, you want to ask a question? Norm, are you here? Okay, in the meanwhile, I'm going to ask a question written by Nitsan Benel. Did you upgrade your gear between the attempts to climb Meru, and was it a game changer to you? Do you feel that was the thing that made the difference? Yeah, great question. Uh, so when we came back in 2011, we had a three-person portal edge, and we also had um, a um, uh, warmer sleeping bags. So <laughs> those two things were pretty key. Uh, so we didn't have warm enough sleeping bags the first time. And Shahal Vitan is asking, how do you improve your mentality of pushing the limit? Oh, uh, just in the same way that you can train physical fitness by staying strong, that you can also um, train mental fortitude and buy strength with that. So um, that's about not giving up and sticking to things, um, whether you're learning a piece of music or doing some writing and just sort of staying uh, connected to it and, and not being like, oh, I just got lazy and uh, you have to, to do that. And um, But it's also, you don't want to let mental bravado and fortitude over uh, overstep what might be um a sensible thing to go do mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. yes um guy the guy one do you have a question yeah hi conrad um, first of all thanks a lot for this uh it's been great and i wanted to ask would you kind of like a two Two-faced question. First of all, would you have would you climb again, like an ex extre extremely difficult route that you have managed to do before? And if yes, what is what motivates you to try a route again after you have already achieved it? I'm trying to find for myself when I'm trying to work on a hard project and, and manage it. It's always 
harder for me to come back to it, just like a regular route that I've done. Yeah. Well, a um, couple of different ways to look at that. If you try something that's at your limit and then you come back to it, uh, especially if it's a rock climb, so the handholds are always constant, you'll have an idea of whether you're getting stronger or you're um, and, and you're progressing or if you're kind of not being as fit and active as you might have been. So um, use it as a benchmark and as a way to measure your ability. Okay, thank you. At this point, I'm yeah. going to um, first of all say thank you. And um, I know I know you're also uh, in, involved in uh, bolting, getting access funds and taking care of nature. And that's exactly what we're trying to do um, in the Israel Climbing Association. At this point, I would um, ask all those of you who are still not members uh, to um, renew your membership or become new members um, that enables us, all of us are volunteers, uh, to keep bolting and uh, take care of the Craigs. I want to say thank you once more, Conrad. Um, I can't thank you enough for uh, agreeing to meet with us here. And you are most welcome to Israel whenever uh, the situation allows it. Uh, you will be uh, hosted here and there is already um, a struggle who's going to be the one to host you. Um, we have great Craigs and again, thank you so much and I'm sure we'll stay in touch. So good night everyone and thank you for being here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, you guys are all very kind. <laughs> I look forward to uh, to visiting Israel and to checking it out, and it's one of the places I it's always where I want to uh, to visit, just out of uh, a personal level. And yeah, let's um, band together as climbers. We're we're good people, and we're there to um, help. the The lessons we've learned through climbing is lessons that are applicable to what we're facing now as humanity, and that um, the manner in which we um, connect with other humans and, and we treat them with um, with kindness and, and respect is something that's fundamental to what climbing is so yeah, keep that up and great to see your community come out and yeah thank you so much everyone and all the faces I see there <laughs> and well um, once you get done with this save it and then um, send me a few pictures of, uh, of Israeli climbing I'll make a post and then a link to it so people that weren't able to watch into this if it's will be archived they can then check it out uh, okay so everyone's writing a huge thank you uh, everyone is uh, super excited I can't thank you enough and definitely uh, continue our uh, relationship uh, to make this a better place for everyone um, so thank you Connor and good night everyone um, we are still planning a lot of big things for you in the community and just like Connor said for me at least community is is the whole point of climbing um and i guess that's it so good night everyone and see yep. you pretty soon i hope in the in the cracks and in the dreams yep we'll take care be well thank you very much thank you, very much. Thank you.